Hello. Okay. All right. You are being recorded. Um, this is Andrew Breitbart, who has written a wonderful book called Righteous In Indignation. Um, highly recommend it. Um, thank you so much for uh, having this interview today. I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure, Sarah. Um, I, I have to say, I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, I, I've... I'm somebody, just to give you some background on me, I went through a political science and German major and then went to law school. So everything you express about your frustrations with the media and the university setting, I've been dealing with it for the past 15 years. So um, I really appreciate your, what, what you're saying here. Um, I was fascinated with something that you said about um, ob objectivity in the media being a, almost a completely impossible, futile concept. Do you think that there is any hope for actual objective journalism today? Well, I, I think that it, it lulls people into sleep. You know, what, what type of person, you know, in, in a capitalist society, uh, you know, many conservatives say, you know what, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to raise a family of four. I don't think that many people uh, are willing to get into stenography or $20,000 a year. It takes a long time to, to make to rise through the ranks of journalism to even make uh, a living, especially within the ranks of professions. I think within the 40, last 40 or 50 years, the type of person who was motivated to get into journalism in the first place were people who were motivated to change the world uh, for the purposes of social justice or economic equality. And those type of people divides what I believe was a false pretense, and that was objectivity. Um, the United States has been filled with partisan media from the very beginning. Much of the world, especially the British newspapers, there are left papers, there are right papers. This idea that Woodward and Bernstein, in their pursuit of Nixon, were objective is laughable. Now that you see them out there on the talking circuit, you can tell that those guys have a partisan edge to them, and they should have a partisan edge to them, but at least be honest about it. And that, to me, is, is the thing about objectivity. Maybe four people have attempted to try and do it, but it is the cudgel that the left has used in a center-right nation to try and uh, control the American narrative. Yeah, I, I found it interesting. I started um, my little blog, which I'm sure you haven't heard of, but that's fine, um, just about a year ago. And from the beginning, I make no apologies. I declare myself a right-wing nut. I say these are the candidates I'm endorsing. I'm not going to be objective. And it still boggles my mind. Friends that know I'm a Republican, know I'm a conservative, will yell at me for not covering a story or not attacking someone. And my response is, it's my opinion. I'm not unbiased. Um, you know, do you think there's any hope in actually getting the mainstream media to, to do more like the European press, where so let's just declare our biases and be done with it? Well, that's where we're moving now, and, and there are people like Katie Couric who aren't happy because she made her money. Oh, Katie Couric's got a perky smile. The smile conveyed that she was your, the girl next door. When this person is as partisan as humanly possible, I get the same thing you get, by the way, from these people here. Why aren't you covering Teleperson? Why aren't you covering Bechtel? I'm like, well, you don't think that the New York Times and CNN and, and ABC, CBS, and NBC are throwing enough of their resources trying to find the elusive uh, corporate Republican connection? You don't think there are enough people out there covering the hoax? Right now, out of nowhere, uh, the organized left declares that the Cokes are the bad guys, and now that's what the New York Times is writing about, and everybody's trying to find something nefarious there. There's already the mainstream media doing that job. We on the conservative side sometimes may find that a Mark Sanford in South Carolina or John Ensign from you know, Nevada are up to no good. I just don't see a proclivity for conservatives to say we need to protect Stanford and Ensign. Usually, it's our instinct to say I wish that these people would go away with dignity so that we could move on with, with fighting you know, these battles. But we are, my, the thesis of my book is the media is everything, and the left has understood that. And it's how they've been able to take a center-right nation and gradually 
Yeah, I found it. Um, something else I found really interesting, the, the history lessons in, in the middle part of the book, talking about the Frankfurt School and some of these early communist and Marxist philosophers, um, I read a lot of that stuff and had to write papers on it in college. Hegel is just as pretentious and full of crap in the original language. Um, but actually drawing the connections to how these very, very radical thinkers who were declaring things that were absolutely antithetical to what American society and freedom and liberty is all about became translated into mainstream accepted thought. Um, what, what do you think that we should be doing, especially as individual citizens, to kind of counteract that at, at the university and, 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 um, and even high school and, and public school settings? Uh, well, that's why I'm creating Big Education as my next website. Uh, you know, most of my battles are less about, you know, the day-to-day -day political battles. You know, that's what a lot of the websites in, in D.C. do that are very oriented towards... Uh, you know, finding out, you know, if there's going to be a filibuster or what the vote's going to be, you know, hand counts and all that type of stuff. Uh, that's not what my sites are, what we're created to do. They were to take on the cultural piece. That's, to me, where it all matters, and that's where the Frankfurt School came in. Uh, the United States was under assault for much of the early 20th century with uh, people that came here wanting to change our politics and change our economic system. And the economic Marxists had a very hard argument with a country like the United States, which offered towards people coming from foreign shores the ability in a generation to go from a peasant with a nickel in their pocket to being the owner of, uh, you know, a, a multi-million dollar, you know, entity. And so economic Marxists had a terrible time, even though in Bolivia or Bulgaria or other countries where there was a fixed you know, ownership class and a fixed peasant class, a serf class, uh, they were, they, those Marxist-Stalinist revolutions were were commonplace. And so when the Frankfurt School came here after leaving Nazi Germany and Mussolini in Italy, these guys came here and interpreted Marx in such a way, into social terms, into cultural terms. And instead of the argument of it being the haves versus the have-nots, the owner class versus the bourgeois class, what ended up happening is they translated into oppressor-oppressed. But instead of it being about the owner, it became about the oppressor. And the oppressor was, from the cultural standpoint, built into these multicultural, you know, uh, par into a multicultural paradigm, where it was blacks are the oppressed, white is the oppressor. White is the oppressor, Hispanic is the oppressed, gay is the oppressed, uh, heterosexual is the oppressor. And so that, that, that multiculturalism is the deconstruction of e pluribus unum, one for many, into something that's quite the opposite. Even though multiculturalism sounds flowery, it is, it is in essence a war against the concept of there being an American culture where people from different places, whether they be rich, middle class, or poor, whether they black, be black, white, Hispanic, straight, or gay, could become full, full-blooded Americans. So I, I believe that those cultural Marxists, the Frankfurt School, said, attack from within, go after the cultural institutions. So they, they aspired to take over the academic world, they did. They turned the English departments and the history departments and humanity, uh, and the entire realm of humanities, into a Marxist indoctrination, you know, breeding ground. Um, the mainstream media, we talked about that previously. That's where you have all these social justice, economic equality-minded advocates who use objectivity as their number one weapon to indoctrinate. And nobody can challenge over the last 40 years that the Hollywood left has been utterly intolerant in its desire to control the American narrative, a left-of-center narrative, and one whose origins, uh, one whose dominance comes from the origins of the Frankfurt School. Yeah, I mean, I, 
just in my own experience, I'm amazed at how often a non-political show, just some silly sitcom, will have the characters completely unrelated to the plot saying something like, oh, and we're so excited to go see this Obama event, or, well, ha-ha, and Bush did this evil thing. Um, I, I, I know you've talked um, in your in your book and elsewhere about connecting conservatives in Hollywood. Um, do you think that there's any hope in you know in um, anytime soon of me being able to turn on some silly sitcom and actually have them say something positive about President Bush um, to actually yeah. have well, something well, like that the, expressed? The Bush is well down the line, but yeah, I think that uh, I've been witness to a minor sea change um, with the emergence of an underground Hollywood conservative class of people that you would never expect in a million years, and there being a lot more, and they're just starting to try and figure out how they can stand up for themselves and to express themselves without being punished, as I call what happens to them when they get outed, uh, plausible deniability blacklisting, because it's not like there needs to be a list. There are enough producers out there who are connected to enough people in a very small social network where there's at least six degrees, there's two or three degrees of separation. Once it comes known that a certain person is conservative, there are any number of producers and directors and actors who simply don't want to be in the same proximity uh, with, with conservatives. So they have to keep their, uh, their lips shut. It's the rare healthy grammar Patricia Heaton and John Voigt that comes out of it. But I will say this, I'm extraordinarily excited about a book that's coming out next month by David Mamet. Um, David Mamet has a book called Secret Knowledge on the Dismantling of, an Ameri of, on the Dismantling of American Culture. Given his pedigree on Broadway and uh, film and television, and the respect that he garnered, probably the, high, the highest regarded modern playwright, for him to go from left to right is nothing short of a miracle for the right. And his book, which I've read, is beyond extraordinary. And it's a, I hate to say it, a better, read, better written book trying to say the exact same thing that my book is saying. Mine is more of a call to arms and gives you an idea how the average person uh, can do something about this feeling of, of helplessness in a media gone, you know, a muck, in a, in a media gone anti-mainstream America. Um, but, but David Horowitz, for the I mean, for, I mean, for David Mamet to have awakened and been in such a fantastic, overwhelming way, hopefully it will foretell others who will, who will take the same trajectory and in the process of doing so will start expressing themselves creatively uh, and not shy away from their own belief systems. Yeah, I think that's that's really valuable. That's something that I've been pushing with our local Young Republican group and some of the other conservative groups is there's a lot of value in making the personal decision to not just sit there and shut up. To, to say well, you just said this crazy liberal thing. I don't agree with that. Or there's a fact that's different. Or like, like I think you pointed out, just just asking why, just asking why. Um, so that's that's really encouraging. Um, wh one thing I always think is very funny is you see liberals getting away with certain things, like you know, you talk about pulling the race card or all the the victimology that um, Ann Coulter talks about all the time. If there was what one thing does the left get away with all the time that really drives you nuts? And if you could wave a magic wand and let the right get away with it too, what one liberal get out of jail free card would you love to have? Oh my! Um, wow! Is this, is this tape the error tape for print? <laughs> um, I'm going to put this on my own um, video website so you can be as blunt and clear and direct as you like. Um, what get, liberal get out of jail free card? Like what tactic? Yeah, like the, the things that they get away with doing all the time that no one ever calls their, no one ever calls BS on. Uh, not everything. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it's just, it's everything. The idea that 
said I would pick one. And the thing is, I like playing. I like playing by the rules that they're not willing to play. You know, I kind of feel like I'm playing tennis against them, and I'm giving them the entire Australian rules you know, side of the court, you know, or the, the doubles side of the court. They, they get away with stuff, but I'm willing to play by the rules. Like, you know, with Acorn, uh, I told James, O'Keefe and Hannah Jobs that they had to put full audio and the full transcript so that there would be full context. Katie Kirk doesn't have to do that. When MSNBC does investigative video, they don't, don't put the full thing. So I actually like being held to the strict standard. I like the idea that I'm fighting them with my hands tied behind my back. Because when I beat them, it makes it all the more fun. <laughs> That's a very good point. Very good point. Well, um, do you have any other projects in the works besides uh, big, big Education? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm very, you know, as I see that much of the way that conservatives, you know, are dependent upon you know, cable news and talk radio to get their ideas across, I really would like to start getting all ideas through different ways. And so I was a uh, participant, I was the subject of a documentary that was made over the last year and a half all in, the, in my defense of the Tea Party. And I, I was very fearful that there wouldn't be enough action. And now I'm fearful that there was too much action. I got into too many skirmishes, exposed too much, uh, you know, corruption and misbehavior by the organized left. And it inspired me to want to do a reality show going into 2012 uh, where I could show America not just who's running for office but how the sausage is made, not just from the standpoint of who's running uh, but who's out there involved in the political trenches and uh, and how the media sausage is made and, and perhaps give people insight into this underground Hollywood conservative world and whether or not some of these people would like to uh, start sticking at their necks out a little bit more. So I'm going to try and be as unpredictable as humanly possible going into the 2012 election cycle to expand conservatism beyond uh, talk. That's awesome. Well, if you need any foot soldiers slash attorneys slash troublemakers slash uh, chicks with a video camera in Florida, let me know. <laughs> uh, I think I may be down in Florida. Like a Republican, uh, convent, uh, uh, the presidency. Young, yeah, young Republicans convention. You know, college Republicans, whatever. So I, I was just in I was just in Jacksonville uh, last Friday. I was in. There was a Palm, Palm Beach probably about two months ago. So I've been spending a good amount of time in Florida ever since uh, you guys got lucky with Rick Scott. Yeah, it's um, we we dodged a bullet, and as somebody who had a front row seat to all the Charlie Crist insanity, I'm uh, I'm just happy to put, be putting that behind us. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, thank you for speaking with me, sir. I really appreciate this very much, and um, thank you so much for your time, and you have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.